Hi there, welcome back to uh, this Holy Week and the Meditations uh, to Tuesday. And as you know uh, from yesterday, we are reading these from a book called The Book of Books by Trevor Dennis. And then once the story is told, I will read a meditation from one of the Nick Fawcett books through the eyes of one of the characters in the story. And then we'll end in a prayer. Um, as I said, we're on Tuesday. And today we're going, to be, we're going to be setting the scene a little bit before we read the actual reading. So please do sit back and get comfortable. Centuries before Jesus was born, when David's son Solomon became king in Jerusalem, they led him down to a spring called Gion, beneath the walls of Jerusalem. A priest anointed his head with holy oil. The people shouted, long live the king! They put a crown on his head and set him on a throne. They sang a special coronation psalm about God declaring, then the, God declaring to the new king, you are my son. Then, so they believed, the Spirit of God descended upon him to give him the power and wisdom to reign. Now Jesus had already been down to the Jordan River when he was baptised by John. He'd heard God say to him, you are my son. God's spirit had come upon him too. Most recently, on the way down the Mount of Olives, the people had shouted, God bless the king! And the children had shouted those same words in the temple court, as we heard yesterday. But no one had anointed him. No one had put a crown on his head. No one had set him on a fine throne. Jesus was anointed but not by the high priest, nor in the temple, nor with any grand ceremony. It was the most extraordinary anointing of a king ever performed. And so to our reading. Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of a leper called Simon, eating a meal with him and some friends. As a Jew, Jesus wasn't supposed to eat meals with lepers or even enter their houses. Lepers were said to be unclean. Their houses and all the things they touched were supposed to be unclean too. But Jesus didn't bother with such things. He never let religious rules and regulations stop him getting close to people. People like Simon were the ones who needed him most. People like Simon were the ones whose company he enjoyed the most too. They were in the middle of their meal when suddenly a woman burst in, carrying a long-necked alabaster jar containing a very expensive, highly scented ointment called spikenard. Most of the men in the room were shocked. It was unheard of for a woman, a complete stranger, to interrupt a group of men eating together. What on earth did she think she was doing? But they didn't have time to ask her that, because next she did something quite astonishing. She broke off the thin neck of the jar and poured the ointment all over Jesus' head. Its sweet, heady scent filled the room. They all looked at the woman open-mouthed, all that is except Jesus. He knew exactly what she'd done. For a spell, there was complete silence. Then someone blurted out, What a waste! Worth a whole year's wages, said another. It could have been sold and the money given to the poor, said a third. You shameless idiot, they all said to the woman. Let her alone, Jesus cried. Let her alone. She knows what she is, has done. It is an act of love, a fine thing, a fine and generous thing. You will always have the poor with you, he continued. There will be plenty of opportunities for you to be kind to them, but you will not always have me. He paused and looked at the woman. Don't you see, he said to the others, she has anointed me. I am now the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ. This woman has played the part of the High Priest. Simon, 
This house of yours has become the very house of God. But this woman knows very well what kind of king I will be and what kind of crown and throne they will give me. She has anointed me for burial also, you see. You know how women anoint the dead bodies for burial. Well, this woman, whose name I don't even know, but who loves me with such a generous love, knows full well that I am as good as dead. And so she has come to prepare me for heaven. I think the scent of her ointment will have reached there already. He turned to the woman. You will always be remembered for this, he said. Wherever people tell my story, they will speak of your great love, your generosity and your wisdom. And so a meditation through the eyes of that woman. Was it guilt that made them turn on me? I couldn't help but wonder, for there were some who'd welcomed me very differently the last time I saw them, eager not only to share my company, but my bed as well. Oh yes, there were a few skeletons in the cupboard that day, enough to wreck many a career and destroy many a family. Is that what they thought? That I'd come to tell all, expose them for the hypocrites they were, it would have served them right if I had. But no, they had nothing to fear. Such revelations were the last thing on my mind. I wanted to see Jesus, that's all, for I'd come to recognise that here was a man different from any I'd known before. Concerned not for himself, but for others. His only desire, it seemed, to bring a little light into the darkness of this world. I'd taken some convincing, mind you, this kind of man I was used to. Many made cynicism come easy, but I'd watched him talking to the multitude, healing the sick, comforting the distressed. I'd seen him welcoming the poor, embracing the little children, accepting the unacceptable. And I knew they Beyond all, I knew then, beyond all doubt, that he was genuine through and through, offering a glimpse of a way of life that could and should be. Quite simply, I was entranced, captivated, longing to discover that life for myself. I had no right to be there, I knew that, but I wanted to respond to show him that he touched me in a way no one else had ever done. Not by body, but not my body, but my soul. So I burst in with my perfume, ignoring the gasps and protests, the cries of outrage, and in a wild, impulsive gesture, I poured it over his head, anointing him with love. You should have seen their faces. I actually think some thought I was making a pass at him but not Jesus. He understood the compassion in his eyes as he looked up at me, the concern, the welcome, sending a tingle down my spine. For these told me, in a way that words never could, that he had time for me, time for the person I was, as much as the person I could become. It cost me something that day, not just the perfume, but my career. For there was no way I could carry on selling my body after that encounter. But I've this horrible feeling that Jesus is going to pay far more for that love, for the love he has for us. For as he leapt to my defence that day, he said the strangest of things, words which have troubled me ever since. Something about anointing his body for burial? Could he really have meant it? He's too good for this world, I've always said that, but surely no one could want to remove him from it, not even his enemies. No one would want to do that. 
Buday. So let's pray. Lord, there are many ready to sneer at faith. Who do they think they are? What makes them so special? We've heard the kind of thing people throw at us. Yet we know that you love us, not because we deserve it, but solely through your grace. We recognise our faults. We acknowledge our sinfulness. And we realise full well that we will never be perfect but we ask you to help us live more authentically as your disciples and to offer our lives as best we can as a joyful outpouring of thanksgiving and a spontaneous expression of praise. Amen. So I'll see you for tomorrow's. Bye.